Welcome to the Health Feeds Performance Podcast, where we believe that whole body nourishment is a requisite for athletic success. I'm your host, Ian Craig, from the Centre for Integrative Sports and Nutrition. And today I'm talking to nutritional therapist Amy Desbro from a very wintry Wales. Most athletes are afraid only of two things, injury and illness. Unfortunately, the winter months can coincide with heavier training volumes or tough competition schedules, which can increase the incidence of upper respiratory tract infections or other types of illness. I'll be talking to Amy about what active individuals can do to support their immune system during the colder months. We're going to be discussing the often forgotten germ versus terrain theory of immunity, plus the effect that training load, stress, compromised sleep, and lack of rest can have on immune immune function. Of course, we'll also be delving into nutrition, including dietary considerations and which supplements may be helpful to active individuals. So, Amy, a big welcome. Um, Thanks for joining me. Um, Why don't you start by introducing yourself and, you know, telling our audience where your personal and professional interest in immunity has stemmed from? Thank you for having me today, Ian. Um, Yes, well, I've been a nutritional therapist now for 12, 13 years, and um, I've always been interested in um, exercise. Um, And in my 30s, I did a lot of training, um, did a lot of running predominantly. Um, I took part in the Cross de Mont Blanc a couple of times. And my my life load, I would say at the time, was really quite um, heavy. I was doing lots of training. I had a couple of kids. I was doing lots of academic training. And um, subsequently, in my early 40s, I um, developed an autoimmune condition called Addison's disease, which has actually um, really focused my mind on how I approach the immune system. When I first trained as a nutritional therapist, um, I was very, very focused on digestion, which is still really, really important and still part of uh, a huge part of how I approach things. But I can, um, I've now got a, a new revived interest in the immune system so that I can help myself stay nice and strong. So that's sort of where my focus is lying. And... Um... You're the co-author of the immune chapter in the textbook of integrative sports and nutrition that we're working on. That's hopefully going to be published in 2025. Um, do you want to share some of your focal points for the chapter? Yeah, um, it's it's a really lovely combination, actually, of um, you know the theory around what's happening with the immune system, but also the practicalities of how we can support the immune system and how athletes can support their health to enable them to continue doing what they they love doing. Um, So there's lots of really interesting takeaways that you can use, you know, whether it's nutrition, nutritional supplements or foods that you can use, but also some really lovely studies in there which show you um, how you can support the body. Um, For instance, um, there's a a lovely uh, debate actually that's discussed which looks at not just the physical things that can affect the immune system, but also the non-exercise aspects. Um, so that might be things like um, stress, your um, your anticipation of, of maybe being able to get into a training, um, if, into a team, uh, travel, jet lag, all these other things that affect athletes. So that's really, you're looking at more aspects or lots of aspects, which is really, which I think gives it a good balance. So that that's kind of our bread and butter type client isn't it where they're not just focused on sport they've got a lot of other lifestyle things going on um, and what we we've termed life load if you try and tell an athlete they're stressed they tend to uh, run away but if you describe their life load and they're studying like like your life um, a few years ago you were studying, you had kids, you were training hard. That's quite a common picture nowadays. So sometimes for me, it's not even the elite athletes that are more immune susceptible. It's more the, um, let's say, very keen and good recreational athletes. Um, Do you want to go a wee bit more into life load and and stress and um, 
maybe sort of chronic factors that uh, people actually have to overcome to support their immune system? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm exactly the same. In, in clinic, you've got, um, I think sometimes when you have um, an elite athlete, that's all they're doing. You know, that is their training, their training regimes. But when you have, um, you know, the everyday person who are still, some people competing at a very, very high standard, um, they're trying to combine, um, you know, children, family life, as well as working, as well as training. And that extra stress, the, the cortisol, you're in fight or flight continuously then. So the cortisol, which, you know, is generally in a, in a balanced situation, anti-inflammatory, but when we have that high stress continually, it creates chronic inflammation and it can really suppress that immune system. Um, and we're looking at not just um, the actual physical stress on the body, which can be anything from eating the wrong foods to um, illness itself to toxins um, and overtraining, but it can also be that perceived stress. So the stresses of what we think could be happening that creates the same sort of stress response in the body as well so all these things um, have a part to play in suppressing the immune function so there's something called um, uh, uh, psychoneuroimmunology um, so that's looking at the relationship between the stress response and the immune system um, and that can have a really big impact as well is that something that you've come across yeah, I'm personally very, very aware of psychoneuroimmunology um, from times where it was potentially my stress load that created the immune compromise. I remember one time sitting with a chronic throat infection for about two months, and then I was um, I was I was entered for this 5K race, and um, at the time I was still ill, so I thought. I'll just go and support my girlfriend. When I got to the race, I'll just do the warm up with my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel too bad actually. I'll I'll just start the race with my girlfriend and, and just run at her pace. Um, right at the start, I felt good, so I went off with the leading guys and felt fine. I ended up winning the race. The next day, the chronic the the throat infection was gone, so. Definitely, that's an example of of the mind stress. I was a, I was a student at the time. There was a lot of uh, end of exam, end of year exam stuff. And I, I think, especially for athletes, because they're thinking, or they might be thinking about, will I get injured? Am I going to be Am I going to be prepared for that race? Am I going to make the team? You know, uh, there's all these other things that you're thinking about alongside the actual stress of doing the training and all, all of the other sort of organisational things. Um, and, you know, it's well, you, you've got that, um, you know, I've, I've seen the, um, uh, the picture of somebody on a rocking horse and it says that, you know, stress is like sitting on, a, on a, a rocking chair, sorry, sitting on a rocking chair. You keep moving, but it doesn't actually get you anywhere. And that thought of stress, it continuously keeps that stress response going, but it's not actually getting you anywhere. You can't, you can't change the situation, but you're thinking about it. And it has the same impact on the body as the actual stress itself. So, yeah, there's, you know, um, quite a lot of research around that. Um, uh, Walsh, um, there's a research paper on how he looks at the impact on the immune system um, with regards to that, that sort of um, PNI, and um, you know, the psychoneuroimmunology. Very interesting. So, yeah, just before we leave that subject cycle neuroimmunology i think it's important just to think about the words the psychology how that affects our nervous system and that how that in turn affects our immune system um and if you've got pn as well psychoneuroendocrinology and basically how the stress affects our whole body so i think if if that's new to you, go and, go and research it. I think it's an incredibly important area that we need to bring into consideration with sporting, sporting clients. Um, Amy, do you want to go back in time a wee bit and talk about the J-shaped curve, um, the relationship between exercise load and volume and you know, immune susceptibility? Yeah, so the, the J-shaped curve um, was, is a model that was formulated by Neiman in the 90s. Um, 
And what, what it's looking at is the uh, susceptibility of upper respiratory tract infections um, alongside exercise load. So what, what he found or what he suggests is that um, there could be a decrease of uh, uh, the, the um, susceptibility of an infection um, if you have a moderate amount of exercise. So compared to a sedentary person, if you have a moderate, moderate, moderately amount of exercise, then you've got a decreased um, susceptibility. But as soon as you up the exercise, so you've got um, extensive exercise and the load on the body, then that means that you're at, he suggests you're at a, an increased um, susceptibility. So it's about what he says, it's about managing that exercise um, how much you do, when you do it, whether you're getting a break, because otherwise it's putting a load on the immune system. So some, some researchers have suggested that the J-shaped curve actually doesn't quite work for the elite athletes. And that's exactly what you said earlier, that sometimes when you have an elite athlete who doesn't need to work, they've got plenty of recuperation time. But, you know, certainly in my experience, it's, it stays true for these really heavy training recreational athletes who also have work, family commitments, maybe lack of sleep, um, lack of nourishment because they don't have time to, to eat properly. And they haven't always got that extra support around them, you know, whether they're getting physio, whether they're getting massages, whether they're getting the, the extras like sauna and, and cold water. And there's all these other aspects that can really support an elite athlete that they might have around them, whereas the everyday um, uh, athlete might not, and it can have that impact. So yeah, it's not a one fit all, is it? It never is. Never is a one fit all. Okay, um, let's talk about my favourite phase phrase. Well, it's not so favourite. Uh, battling your bugs. So in the COVID era, I actually saw newspaper article headlines talking about battling our bugs. Um, now. Should we be trying to battle our bugs? Should we be trying to kill our bugs, our viruses, our bacteria? We've got more bacterial bacteria and viruses in our as than our human cells. So let's go into the terrain versus uh, the germ versus terrain theory a bit because it's a very very old one, but I think still apt today. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know, so you've got the two different camps. You've got the the gym theory where they think that's what we should be doing. We should be battling the gym, clearing out the gyms and the terrain theory where we're looking at, OK, what is is the terrain good? So by that, we're looking at the human body when we, we're looking at being um, exposed to viruses and bugs. Is our terrain nice and strong? Have we got really good, um, strong gut bacteria? You know, is the immune defences strong? Um, and so what the terrain theory is saying is that if your terrain is strong, then it becomes inhospitable to the gym. So you've got this balance all the time. And I think, you know, we have to consider the germs. We can't, we can't, you know, disregard the germs. But actually, the human body, if we make that terrain nice and strong and we look at all the elements, so we're not just looking at one thing, we have to look at is the gut bacteria that's strong? Are we eating enough um, foods that are supplying us with all the antioxidants? We got getting enough fats. So we're making that immune system strong. Are our hormones balanced? Is the blood sugars balanced? What's inflammation like? All these things have an impact on our terrain. Are we stressed? Are we overweight? You know, are, all these things have an impact. And if the terrain is nice and strong, then it makes it so much harder for the germs to take hold and do whatever they're going to do. So that that's that balance. And I think we can't just decide, um, okay, let's just clear out all the germs. That's the way to do it. Because then... We all know what happens if we take antibiotics um, to clear a particular bug, which we do need antibiotics at times, absolutely. But at the same time, it does destroy that gut bacteria. We need to make sure we're putting the bacteria back in to make us strong. So it's that balance all the time, I think. So um, Antoine Bichamp has that lovely, um, lovely quote, germs seek their natural habitat, diseased tissue rather than being the cause of diseased tissue. So it's about looking at the health of the tissue, the health of that, um, the lovely terrain. Um, and if it's not healthy, if the, if the tissue is diseased, then the germ can take hold. Um, and then that's when it can start causing problems. 
and flipping that statement around, if your um, tissues are healthy, they don't attract the germ nearly so much. Yeah, that's very powerful. I know in nutritional therapy, we use antimicrobial strategies. Um, and some practitioners will maybe use them a little bit too much. Uh, I certainly used them early in my career where the person wasn't healthy enough, wasn't energetic enough, and then they, they just got ill. Um, so I learned quite quickly that you actually need to reinforce the system or support that terrain before you go in with antimicrobial strategies. Although, although you can do gentle stuff, can you? Like uh, adding extra garlic into your diet is antimicrobial. No, I totally agree. Um, there are, you know, I, I think people see things, don't they? You know, um, parasites or, you know, we need to have a big cleanse. We need to do a massive, massive detox or, or whatever it is. And actually, a lot of the time, if you supply the body with what it needs to do the job, it will do it naturally. You know, the liver works really well if you provide it with the right nutrients. The gut can rebalance quite well if you make sure it's getting, you know, plenty of prebiotic, probiotic and um, postbiotic if you need it. Um, occasionally when um, there is, you know, uh, perhaps a parasite or something, you might need to deal with that further down the line. But first of all, I totally agree. It's about doing what you can to make the body as strong as it can first needs to be able to deal with any fallout of dealing with a, a toxin or, or a parasite or a, a bug of whatever kind. If, if the if the body isn't strong enough to deal with it, then you're going to leave the person feeling worse than they were before. So, yeah, I think it's about where possible get helping the body do the job it needs to do. Let, let's just uh, talk about the C word briefly. Uh, we've talked about stress. So the C word is cortisol. Um, Cortisol is, yeah, a lot of people swear at cortisol because they think it's bad, but it's a physiological function. And something I say to my students is anything that's innate to the body is meant to be there and it's got important functions. So short term cortisol is very anti-inflammatory. Short term cortisol can keep us from getting ill. That, that example of the stressed exec who's trying to finish deadlines um, in a very stressed state before he or she goes on holiday. And then bang, they go on holiday and, <laughs> and get ill. Yes. So can you, can you tell us a wee bit more about chronic cortisol load? Yeah, um, and you know, I think that's what so many people are dealing with nowadays. You know, we live lives that oh, we're in a fight or flight from the time we wake up in the morning to the time we go to bed. And you know, even the first thing you do in the morning, lots of people on with their phones, see what their emails are. You know, they haven't even had time to have breakfast and straight away they're dealing with the day's activities. So that, that chronic cortisol um, is actually gone from being anti-inflammatory to being pro-inflammatory. You know, it's, it's encouraging the production of um, inflammatory cytokines, which then compromises the immune system. So, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming, um, and it's dysregulating your hormones, your blood sugars, you know, it's having a chronic impact on the whole body. Um, but, you know, with regards to the immune system, it's suppressing that immune function. And it's one of the things they did look at, I think, wasn't it, with regards to COVID, when people started, when they started to do certain research as to who was becoming susceptible. Um, people who were chronically stressed or overweight or, you know, that, which again is a stress on the body, they, um, they were shown to be more susceptible um, to COVID or getting COVID in a um, more aggressive format and for long COVID. So it's really, really detrimental to the immune function. Okay, so you mentioned long COVID, which is a kind of post-viral fatigue syndrome. And I think related to that, it can be autoimmunity in many cases as well. So can you... You know, this is a very knowledgeable area for you. So can you tell us a wee bit more about that relationship with life balance and stress and going into autoimmune states? Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure that's one of the um, the impacts that had had on me was my life load. And I, I, if you'd have asked me, was I stressed? I didn't feel stressed, but my body was in that stress response um, you know, for a long period of time, really, because I was 
trying to carry too much. And I think that happens a lot with any sort of um, autoimmune condition. When you actually speak to the people that have it, if you look at their life load, they are managing, they're often very, very, uh, I like quite a lot of athletes, very, very focused and very driven. Um, and so that high that, that, that high cortisol all the time is, is weakening, actually not just the immune system, not just um, affecting the immune system, but it's affecting the gut bacteria, which means again that we become more susceptible to immune reactions. Um, the, the immune system just becomes um, dysregulated and it starts attacking itself rather than attacking germs. Um, we have a situ situation, especially when the gut bacteria becomes compromised due to the stress response, where we then we get in, we might get leaky gut, meaning that uh, proteins are getting into the bloodstream that shouldn't be there. The immune system then has to try and attack. So that's when we have things like um, gluten getting into the bloodstream. The immune system is fired up for the wrong reasons, and then it can become confused and then start attacking self. So the, the stress response has a huge impact. Cortisol, when it's high, can have such a huge impact on so many aspects of the body. And I've heard autoimmunity been described by uh, Michael Ash um, as loss of tolerance of self or lack of tolerance of self. So the immune system should be tolerant to its own tissues, but something's going out of balance that can start triggering response against its own tissues. Um, and I want to emphasize here, I had a very busy practice in Johannesburg, which is, it's kind of like London on steroids. It was very, very stressed out individual, a, a strong stress culture of doing everything. And people were getting up at four in the morning to go and do training for Ironman. Ironman was so popular. A Comrades Marathon, which is 90 kilometers. I was seeing the last five years of my practice there, I saw a lot of autoimmunity in sport. So it's not just the domain of the sick and unhealthy, yeah. it's also the domain of the apparently healthy uh, and definitely somewhat fit. Yeah, definitely. And I think also when we consider um, what we're exposed to a lot of the time now, so, you know, um, toxins, there's way more, we're exposed to so much more toxins on our, in our day-to-day -day life which is putting such a huge burden on the, on obviously our liver having to deal with it, but also the immune system it has to deal with the toxins that we're, you know, um, I was reading um, an article the other day that was saying that, um, well, the amount of toxins we're exposed to is, is, a, is a large amount on a day-to-day -day basis, but actually it's not just one toxin plus another toxin. When they are put together, then it's it, it's threefold, fourfold, the, the impact on the body. So which, this, it, this, impact this um constant barrage that the body's under the immune system has to deal with that and then it becomes so worn out so tired it can't deal with other things like if you've been exposed to a virus or whatever whatever it is and so so it's not just autoimmunity which has an impact which can be impacted with these toxins it is just general auto general immune function um, and so we just need to be careful about what we're exposing ourselves to, whether it's from our food, whether it's what we're washing our face in, washing our clothes in. You know, it's, we, we, we have to do what we can to reduce that. And, and um, athletes, you know, they, they can be exposed to this a lot with all the different, you know, bottle, you know whether they're buying a, um, an energy drink in a plastic bottle or, or whatever it is thinking about what they're using to reduce that exposure can have a really big impact on, on our immune function. Yeah, we're in a modern day toxic experiment at the moment. Um, it's just an expo exponential increase of what we're exposed to. Uh, also EMFs, electric man magnetic frequencies, that's, you know, I emphasize that quite strongly. We're constantly connected and, and surrounded by Wi-Fi, radiations, 3G, 4G, 5G, etc. Um, and we don't know the consequence of that. The amount of people who sleep with their phone right next to them, on. <laughs> I, you know, it's just not only the, um, again, the stress response for is the phone going to ding or ring or whatever, but it's that, yeah, we don't know what it's doing to our brain waves, to information, to, yeah. It's uh, it's definitely an unknown that um, more research is needed. Yeah, I mean, 
certain research so far has indicated it, it's a pro-oxidant. It, it creates oxidative stress. So, in other words, it competes for our antioxidant systems. And if you're an athlete and you need a lot of antioxidants to buffer the exercise stress, it could be a problem. Um, okay, so let's move on to a few little strategies for, for immunity. And I know, I know you like jumping in the, the freezing cold uh, Welsh water. So tell us about cold water immersion strategies. Yeah, no, I do, I do. <laughs> um, well, I mean, and obviously, you know, Wim Hof, is, he's, um, he's started a, a massive trend with it as well. But it does... It works wonderfully at um, supporting the vagus nerve or the vagal tone, uh, which calms the whole body down, which is then obviously calming that whole cortisol uh, response down, um, calming the adrenaline, just helps to control that stress response. Um, You can't be stressed when you're in freezing cold water. Um, You, um, you know, it it immediately calms everything down. So it's the hormetic hormetic stress response, um, which is then a positive stress response. Um, It the the thing is though, with all of these, with all of these, um, you know, this cold water, this sauna, you have to be again mindful of the person doing it. It's not. I, I think we need to be careful that we don't just say right, everybody go and jump into freezing cold water. You have to be mindful of the person, you know, if you've got pre- pre-existing conditions, um, you know, you have to look at whether the person is very, very slight, you know, perhaps they haven't got enough um, fat reserves to help deal with that cold response immediately. You have to you have to work your way up to it, or maybe start in the summer months where it's not so cold. So there's lots of considerations, but the evidence, there's a growing evidence to support cold water in calming that whole nervous system which again will help the inflammation calm down and, and support the immune function likewise saunas saunas are really popular as well and i i use both myself okay that, that's quite clarifying amy um so cold water immersion is not a black and a white you know the more the better um it's figuring out where the person's at and and what their what their tolerance tolerance is I mean, I personally have got hardly any body fat, so it, it's a big physiological stress if I go into very cold water. But I'll maybe do it with a wetsuit and do some swimming, uh, and that works for me. But I prefer the sauna. Yeah. Um, and you've talked before about cold shock proteins and heat shock proteins, so can either extreme help that hermetic response? Yeah, both of them. Both of them um, provide a, a moderate stress on the body that the body can deal with, which helps to regulate um, insulin response, um, immune function, cortisol. So yeah, they're both really supportive. I think you know the the overarching thing to always remember with all these things is the personal the person who's doing it. So just like you were saying, you know, it doesn't work for you going in the cold water. And I think what can happen sometimes is people think to themselves. Okay, this is the latest trend. I must be going in the cold water. You know, I must. The amount of people that I see now are forcing themselves every day to go into a bucket of cold water in the garden in the rain. And I'm sure the stress of thinking about doing it is is worse. You know, it's not worth it. You know, it's about I like finding a time and a and a place and an energy that is is going to be supportive. And if that's supportive and the cold water, it would be a cumulative effect. But I think if you're going in the cold water or if you're forcing yourself to have a sauna, but the, the, the action of doing it is, is stressful before you do it, I think it's counteractive. Yeah, likewise. Let's go into food. We've talked a lot about lifestyle aspects. Um, so the general kind of assumption around food and immunity is a, quote a good balanced diet is what you need but that's a bit of a general term and I'm sure we can go into some more specifics around what food and nutrition is supportive to the immune system so what are just to get us started on this Amy what are some of your favorite food recommendations for clients that need to bolster their immunity uh, veggies. I start with the veggies. We want a, a rich diet of 
polyphenols, which are really useful for feeding the gut bacteria, which make the immune system stronger. We want all the um, antioxidants. So rainbow of veggies, um, all different colours. Um, we want to be getting, you know, up to 30. The, the recommendation is 30 different plant forms in a week different. So we want to be looking for the variety. So I always suggest that somebody has at least half their plate vegetables. Um, and it's not just, you know, peas and broccoli and carrots. You want to have a bit of everything. And we want to be including, you know, onions and garlic and chilies. And we want to be adding in sprouted broccoli seeds. And we want to be, you know, we want to be showing off on our plate, you know, you know, pimping it up so it's as impressive as it can be with all the different veggies, all the different colours. Um, we want to be looking for um, good quality protein. Um, obviously, for a vegetarian, they need to be looking at other sources. So we want to make sure we're getting our pulses in. We want to get things like quinoa in, which has got a, is a complete protein as well. But the protein is helping the repair and renewal. Um, good quality meat, um, and then you know fish, oily fish. Um, and, you know, I, I just love adding in the little extras. So making sure there's fermented food on the plate, because that's really, really important for the gut bacteria to make the immune system stronger. If that gut bacteria is thriving, then that's really going to help the immune function straight away. You know, that's the, that's the first response for the immune system is from the gut. So we really need to be that nice and strong. Um, so fermented foods can be from adding in, you know, a handful of olives, um, you can do things like sauerkraut and kimchi. Um, but for those that don't like that sort of flavour, I always suggest things like miso. You can add that to, well, I add it to everything. I mean, there's not much that my, my kids always say when I say, what's the magic ingredient? They say, oh, is it miso, mum? Because I add it to everything. Um, and it's just always thinking about what you're adding to every single plate that's going to give you that extra boost. Um, and, you know, raw olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. It's so simple, just drizzle it on all your meals. It's getting these extras in all the time with every meal will slowly build up um, the immune immune strength. Okay, so there's a few things there. Diversity, I heard. I also got a couple more questions to ask you from what you said. So let's talk about polyphenols. Um, and I think that's, that's a, got a growing interest in research. But you, you mentioned Neiman, David Neiman earlier, and he and colleagues came up with a J-shaped curve. Around yeah. about 2010, they were looking at uh, quercetin, which yeah. is a polyphenol, and um, green tea extract. Yeah. And they were, yeah, they were finding good mitochondrial support and immune support from these. Uh, so. Just extend a wee bit out on the polyphenols, what they are and, you know, what to look out for in the dietary sense. Yeah, so things like berries and cherries and plums and apples, you know, th these are all rich in the polyphenols. Um, and, you know, um, onions, did I say onions? Onions, um, you know, beets. And the, the, the onions, they're rich in quercetin as well, which you were just mentioning, which um, have strong antioxidant um, properties, um, anti-inflammatory, you know, they're just really going to help support all the different functions of that immune function. Um, and they, they're also anti-pathogenic as well. And they, they're prebiotic, so they're feeding the gut bacteria. So, you know, we can have probiotics, which um, you can take, you can have as food source, or you can take as a supplement. But it's you want to be feeding the gut. It's a bit like feeding your garden. Um, you feed, if you're going to grow... Um, carrots or whatever, veggies, you make sure the ground is really, really nurtured and you're fed it with lots of nutrients so that they grow nice and strong. It's the same with the gut. And these foods are feeding that gut bacteria to make it nice and strong. Um, while it's also being really rich in antioxidants, so they're mopping up the um, any oxidation that's being caused. Okay, so that runs into my second question, which was around gut health. Um, so can you extend into the relationship between the gut and the uh, immune system. And you gave it a really nice analogy of feeding your garden there, which is your microbiome. Why is the microbiome so important for our immunity? So if you think about the lovely, um, uh, sorry, I'm going into discussing with my clients now, I always use my hands to describe things. But if you think about the digestive tract and the lovely 
um, mucous membrane going down the, the digestive tract and all the bacteria sitting in there. We want that mucous membrane to be nice and plump and uh, fed um, and so that we've got the right, because that's the, the immediate um, conversation from, from the digestive tract to the immune system happens, happens within that mucous membrane. And if we're not making sure that it's nice and healthy with the foods we eat, with the bacteria that's growing, um, then we're going to be getting the wrong information. The immune system is going to get the wrong information um, and we're going to end up with gaps, which can lead to things like leaky gut. The inflammation is going to, going to um, rise in the body. So that gut is really important. It's, the, it's you know, 70% of the immune system begins in the gut or 70-ish. Um, begins in the immune system and that's where we want it's the first line of defense so that's where we want the gut to be doing its job killing what it, you know any microbes that we're being exposed to we want that information to be nice and strong and not to be confused and what about foods that could be negative towards gut and gut-based immunity anything processed sugar <clears throat> alcohol Trans fats, you know, all, all of the packaged foods, all the foods that um, often people crave when it's uh, when they're stressed. So it goes hand in hand. You know, we talk about stress, but when people are stressed and they're tired, they sometimes crave these sorts of foods. So it's, it's all the chemicals, toxins, uh, antibiotics can affect it. Um, and, you know, sugar, sugar is the main culprit, really sugar and alcohol and um, those processed foods really, really have a huge impact on that gut bacteria and stress. I'm just going to make a comment on the alcohol because people might be freaking out. Oh, I have to give up sugar and alcohol. Um, for me, it's I've got in the book that I wrote a few years ago called Wholesome Nutrition, I use the, the phrase pay double and drink half. So whether it's wine, beer, whiskey, whether it's coffee, chocolate, uh, all, all the good stuff in life, pay double means get the really good stuff. So we were talking about polyphenols and one of the best sources is red wine uh, from the concentrated grape extract. But you don't have to drink very much of it for the alcohol to overload, <laughs> the throw the balance the other way around. So, it says drink a bottle of red wine for my poly polyphenols. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one glass is good. And, and when you go into the blue zone research that's been done and it's, been, it's getting popular again, and that's hot spots in the world where they found unusual numbers of centurions that are healthy in mind and body. They mostly all had red wine that was locally produced. So not with preservatives, it's, you know, lovingly made. So the, there's a food culture as well. So made, made with love. And it's all about balance, isn't it? It's always, always about balance. You know, um, I, I, I see people who are so strict on absolutely everything they eat and they won't do this and they won't do that. And they are so stressed from doing all of that. They're doing much more harm than having a glass of red wine or if you go out for a meal not overthinking it and you just relax and enjoy it it's about balance but I think if the majority of the time you're feeding the body with what it needs and then it's a Saturday night and you're having a cup a glass or two of wine and you're having a bit of chocolate or whatever that balance works um, it's just it's about making sure that you're allowing the body the nutrients it needs the majority of the time that whole 80 20 rule I think works really well um and it's the same as the whole stress situation as well. So, you know, a glass of wine can be very relaxing, you know. But then when, once you get to a bottle and a half, then the body's stressed. So it's it's always about balance. And, you know, getting a really good glass of whiskey, you know. You're in Scotland. You have nice whiskey in Scotland. <laughs> it's balance, isn't it? <laughs> very much, very much. And also the company you're with. And there's a cracking little word called, well, big word, conviviality. And when I share that, I bring up a, a slide of people, you know, a bunch of people around the table enjoying a meal. Somebody's playing a guitar. They're all chatting. So when you, yeah, rather than sitting on your own, drinking lots of beer and you're, and you're watching TV, 
yeah, go out and have one one drink with a good friend, and that makes a big difference. Absolutely, and and that whole you know, I I often say to people, you know, make sure you sit down and eat your meal. Oh yeah, yeah, I do that. But I, but then I'm like, well, don't talk about religion or work or you know, be relaxed, enjoy the meal. You know, it's about people. We don't give ourselves enough time to relax and enjoy and let the body calm. Um, it's really important. Yeah, and that's feeding into the P and I stuff we talked about earlier. All right, let's go. Let's chunk down even more and talk about nutrients. So, nutrients, as in nutrients that you would maybe eat certain foods to get more of. When you're, let, let's talk about athletes going through a heavy winter's training and they're just trying to preempt not getting ill. So, nutrients that are found in common foods but also that you can take as a supplement. So what are your favourites? What are your go-tos that you'll give your children and you'll give your athletic clients when it's winter time? Well, my children have just had chicken box. Um, <laughs> and, they're, and they're teenagers, so they didn't get it when they were little. So they've now, so it's a bit worse when you're a teenager. Um, and I have to say, vitamin C and vitamin D are, I would say, essentials through the winter whether or not you're, you know, whatever your age, whatever you're doing, vitamin D, so much research around vitamin D. Um, and especially now that, that the research has been even stronger since COVID and long COVID. So it's definitely important to get that vitamin D, um, those vitamin D levels. Vitamin C, obviously you can get that through your diet really well. We're going back to that half a plate full of veggies, you know, you can get some fruit in there. Vitamin C is easy to get in through the diet. Um, so I would definitely up that, but also consider um, a vitamin C supplement. I think that can be really useful. It's so, so, um, well, there's so much research on that. Um, it's antioxidant, it's, you know, anti-inflammatory. It's, it's just got so many immune boosting um, uh, properties. So definitely for that. Zinc. Um, zinc is great. Um, it's great for T cell function and natural killer cell. Again, something that's been researched a lot, and especially again over COVID and long COVID. So I would be thinking zinc. But I, I one of my favorites is mushrooms. Um, that's um, a real, um, I think it's coming more and more to the fore. Um, there's not a huge amount of research with it at the moment, but there is research. So for instance, um, I use reishi and cordyceps. Um, and there's recent re research from, you know, 2021, 22 um, on the impacts of and how they can support and particularly reishi with long COVID, really good for upper respiratory fact, uh, tract infections and long COVID. Um, and cordyceps is great for energy. So really good for athletes as well as being um, a really good immune neurologic managing, balancing the, the immune system. So mushrooms are really good. Um and beta glucans, which of course are really mushrooms, are rich in beta glucans anyway. Um, they they good immune immune modulators, um, so I like those as well, as well as omega threes and pre and probiotics. So that's a really good start. Um, you mentioned vitamin C, uh, which has got strong antiviral properties. Um, and you're going back to Linus Pauling type research there. So vitamin C is very well established. Yeah. Vitamin D over the last decade or so. But yeah, I remember seeing compelling data on vitamin D during the COVID time with regards to how well people got through the, the virus or were less susceptible to, to catching. Yeah, and it's really interesting. I, I would say, well, I, I ask all my clients now, um, every client to get a vitamin D test. It's about 30 quid, hardly anything, just to see where their levels are at. And my goodness, you would not believe how many are in the extremely low levels of vitamin D. So many people struggle with um, absorbing their vitamin D. Um, so it's, I think it's a really important aspect to look at. Yeah. And we, we tend to blame the lack of sunshine. So we're both in the United Kingdom and we're in the middle of the winter. We haven't seen the sun for a few months. And we blame that on, well, lack of vitamin D on, on that. But I was in South Africa for 12 years and I dealt with a lot of athletes who were getting out on their bike and running in the sun, strong sun. But most of them had depleted vitamin D as well. So... 
I've sort of been wondering about the conversion because obviously it's kind of converted ultimately from cholesterol um, and it's when stress is involved that life that life load we've talked about I think the conversion is uh, is less yeah and if you add that on that um, whether or not somebody's got a genetic predisposition predisposition to not being able to so for instance the VDR gene for me and I checked mine with my autoimmunity I have a uh, tendency it could be more it could be more difficult for me to um, convert it and um, so I always make sure I'm, I'm you know I'm actually supplementing with it but then add on that as well as the stress add on that that we all plaster ourselves with sun cream now because we're worried about skin cancer and we stay covered up and you know there's lots of aspects I think um, and we're not out as much even you know the athletes that we're cycling a lot if you go back 100 years or back, to, if you look at the um, the Blue Zones um, book again, a lot of people worked the land. They were out all the time. So the skin becomes more um, robust and they didn't use sun cream and they would have naturally been absorbing it, um, I think. So, yeah, there's lots of aspects to it. The antioxidant reserves became the sun cream, basically. Again, sun damage. Um what about coenzyme Q10? Because uh, that, that's used as an antioxidant. It's, used, it's part of the um, oxidative phosphorylation in the Krebs cycle for production of ATP and mitochondrial energy. Um, has that got a role in immunity? Yeah, definitely. You know, and it's, it's fat soluble. So we need to be making sure that we are getting our fats to in the light with the vitamin D. You know, if we're not getting our fats in the diet then it's difficult to absorb our fat soluble vitamins so i think that has an impact and you know definitely so important for the brain and for that whole um processing of what we're doing it's really useful for reducing that inflammation that we see a lot of people have with the, the you know the the raised inflammatory markers so yeah definitely um and you know i think it can work hand in hand I, there's a lovely I don't know if we're allowed to, there's a lovely product that I sometimes use I won't say the name um, that has omega-3 and coenzyme Q10 together so that I think that is a lovely combination then you're getting them you know you're getting all that lovely um, fatty um, vitamin and nutrient in one go. I remember a researcher called Carlson um, he worked with Swedish cross-country skiers um, in the late 90s and he was monitoring vitamin D serum vitamin D and CoQ10 levels and he was finding that he was charting them based on those levels and the higher amounts cor correlated very very strongly with the people that got um, ill less often and below a certain th threshold amount these skiers were losing quite a few days uh, on an average monthly basis during heavy training due to illness so yeah, I think it's not considered a direct immune support like vitamin C and D, but the fact it's energetically supporting us and it's an antioxidant uh, is really, really key there. Yeah, and, and you know, if you are exhausted, then the immune system is having to work harder. Isn't it? It's just, it, you know, energy is needed for every function of the body, including the immune system. So, yeah, if you can boost the immune system with things like CoQ10, it's, it's given that stability, isn't it, I suppose? So go back to your mushrooms. Um, I always like asking, you know, when practitioners have a, a favorite. Um, so you obviously use them personally. You mentioned reishi. Reishi is a wee bit more associated with immunity. And then cordyceps a bit more associated with uh, energy. I've used that one a lot with adaptogens for like adrenal fatigue and, and general stress management. So. Is there more you can say about how how we would use them and what kind of results you've seen? Um, I I like to use them. I often use a, a, a combination rather than just one on its own. So I definitely would use reishi and cordyceps. Sometimes um, lion's mane is in the in the news a lot more at the minute because it's really good for clarity. So. It's, I, a lot of ladies that like to use lion's mane going through the menopause and what have you it really helps that concentration but I find a combination um and I you know I see the difference and I think 
more than anything on energy and um, and being more robust, just actually feeling more robust and being able to deal with um, the stresses and not getting as many, they just, they, they report not getting as many coughs and colds. So the immune system is definitely being supported. So I, I mean, the research is coming out and it's becoming there's more and more research into it, but I, I anecdotally in practice and from personal use have found it really, really useful. Um, there is, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if you want me to say any supplements as such, but um, that I use, you know, brands, but um, there are complexes which we can work really well. Um, there's also actually, um, if, if there are athletes that are not wanting to take another supplement, you can get the powders that you can just pop into your smoothie. So if you're doing a, a post-exercise um, smoothie, you can just stick a spoonful in, use it like you would use your foods, but they're a condensed powder. That can work really, really well as as well as a you know if you don't want to take. Sometimes people get a bit fed up taking loads and loads of supplements, so this can work well because it's more of a food source. And that and that brings up another point, Amy. As well, we haven't really talked about nutrient timing and support specifically around training, but if if an athlete does a hard training session, maybe maybe in a fasted state or maybe they haven't eaten for a while, and then they leave it for a while before they replenish it can put them into a more of a stress state. The, the cortisol levels will rise, can cause a transient insulin resistance as well. Um, so that post-exercise smoothie for some people is going to be quite important. So if you can dose up with some something like mushrooms as well, uh, that's a, like a triple whammy effect of uh, helping them re- recover before their next session. Yeah, I would say it could work really well. And, you know, and you've got so many other powders you can put in now, you know, um, you know, see buckthorn powder. You know, there's lots of, of ways to really boost that smoothie without actually having to take another meal or, you know, you, you just bung it all in the same smoothie and it's over and done with. And I would always add in a prebiotic in there, something like PHGG, um, you know, on top of, you know, you'd have your protein and your carbs and whatever it is you're, you're putting in there. But, um, you know, making sure you're getting at every opportunity, finding a way of getting more nutrients in to support um, your bodies. Because as an athlete, you're pushing pushing the limits all the time. So you need to keep adding in that, that lovely um, nutrient support. And my favourite is the red powder, which is generally a freeze-dried bunch of berries, maybe tomatoes, um, and just throw that in the smoothie as well. And that brings in more polyphenols that we're talking about. There's a lovely um, uh, turmeric and collagen latte. I won't say the name. Um, that's another way of getting it. You know, turmeric is great. So, so supportive, again, for reducing the inflammation. And turmeric is great for the liver, for helping the detox and just really helping support every function of the body. So, yeah, it's just making sure, you know, if one of your drinks is going to be a green tea and one of your drinks is going to be a turmeric latte and, you know, you still have your cup of coffee, if you want a cup of coffee or whatever, but it's just trying to get these extras in throughout the day, I think. And each of those is polyphenol supporting. The coffee has polyphenols. The green tea has polyphenols. Black tea has as well, just not as much as green tea. And then turmeric, so that's curcumin in turmeric, um, turmeric powder or, you know, the whole... Um, the whole piece, it's like, a, it's like a root, isn't it? It's like ginger root. Um, turmeric's been very associated with anti-inflammation, but as research starts to stretch, we're realizing that nature knows best. Nature is not as simple as one food does one thing. One food can do a lot of different things, and, and that's the exciting bit. I think turmeric has uh, adaptogenic properties as well, and then all the classic adaptogens like Siberian ginseng or withania or rhodiola, they have some immune supporting benefits as well. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, the, the, and all, again, all of these you can have as a powder. So you can just bung it in your, your smoothie. It doesn't have to be another supplement. So, yeah, I think it's just about pimping up your meals, isn't it? You know, showing off. <laughs> See what you can get into. Every, you know, don't miss an opportunity to get those nutrients in and variety all the time. So it might be that you want to do turmeric one day, 
do the the freeze dried berries another day. You know, just mix it all up. Just get the variety in there, and the immune system will definitely thank you for it. So food first approach, and then you've got these kind of food like supplements that we've been talking about, the powders as an additive, and then you can you can go into specific vitamin Ds and Cs and and so on when when you're maybe concerned about immunity more. And I've seen one of my students um, did that in a recent assignment. He talked about an immune-supporting day-to-day diet and then some supplements that he would recommend to a client all the, all the way through the year for immune support. But then he had his like supercharged extras that if they're coming down with something or it's a particular time of the year when they're training hard and stuff is going around. So I think that's a nice approach as well. Yeah, I mean, echinacea is always good to have in the cupboard, isn't it? So if you're starting to come down with something or somebody in the family's come home with a cold, yeah, start on the echinacea, just for, keep yourself nice and strong. It works really, it's a really good antiviral, um, but not for all the time, just for as a, so that's a, that's a good go-to really. Great, I'm glad we finished with echinacea. It's one of my favorites as well. So thanks a lot, Amy. I think that was a really interesting immune discussion. Um, If anyone wants to get hold of you, to follow you, how do do they find you? So uh, my website is eatwell-feelwell.co.uk or you can email me at amy at eatwell-feelwell.co.uk. Thanks, Amy. I really appreciate the generous input of Amy and all my other guests on the Health Feeds Performance podcast. To watch or listen to more of my interviews, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Spotify. I'd also really like to know what other sports nutrition topics you would like us to cover in the future. So please connect with us via our website, which is www intsportsnutrition.com where you'll also be able to read about an array of sports nutrition courses that we run.